have our next guest on this On The Mark podcast. He was recommended by Kevin Sprecher, and uh, it's Brian Levbetovich, and somehow I managed to wrangle you, my friend. You're a busy guy. Welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, look, let's be honest. You've earned basically every accolade there is in golf. You're a golf digest, top 100 teacher in the USA. You, you, you teach multiple LPGA players, corn fairy players. The list is endless. For our listeners who might not be aware of you, uh, global folks, please tell us a little bit about you before we dive into what we're doing. I pretty much grew up in the East Coast, played college golf, and then after college went to work for Jim McLean, trained with Jim for the better part of 18 years uh, in Florida, Michigan, and in California. Worked kind of on and off the tour as well with people at PGA West and in different locations, met Christy Kurtz or Jim McLean, and then spent the last 25 years just primarily teaching golf only and most of it at PJ West in Joaquin, California. So how did the pivot happen? Because, you know, there's a lot of folks, maybe aspirin instructors, players who are struggling. How did the, pull, the, the, the move from playing in college to then all of a sudden deciding you're going to teach this thing for a living? What was the catalyst? That's a good question. Like when it first started to happen, I, I can't really say that I was a hundred percent on board with the decision. Um, I went from work, working at private clubs, most notably Caves Valley in Baltimore, Maryland, and did a couple, did an internship with Jim uh, the first winter there. And then my second winter down, I was trained as his personal assistant for about 18 months. And that's kind of what got things started. From there, I just went into teaching full time. Well, he's such a great mind. Uh, I've, I've had limited experience with him, but he's always been so approachable. And I've got lots of his books. You know, I learned from David Ledbetter myself. But, but, but Jim, just the way he described the thing, the way he viewed the game, to me, he's a real player's instructor. And as I look at the information you're about to share, you, it seems to me like you, you adopt a similar bent. Yes. A real player sort of a guy. Okay, let's, let, let's dive into the stuff. You work, you work with multiple PGA, uh, LPGA winners, I should say. And I reached out to you and I'm like, I honestly believe, Brian, that the club golfer, even men, can likely learn more from watching LPGA players than they can the PGA Tour guys because the PGA Tour guys play the game at a different speed. Now, look, LPGA ladies are getting faster and stronger and all the rest of it, but there's more parity. So I said to you, how about it? How about you share some insights? And you were like, by all means, this is right up my alley. So, so why don't you kick it off with some things? Just, just tee us off with something that uh, the listeners, viewers can try just to improve their game. Things that if they're watching LPGA golf, they might see. I think a lot, a lot of the places people are searching for information now is, is definitely through the internet. And mm -hmm. whether or not it applies to them directly is, is hard to hard to know what they find but i think as you're watching the girls or, or if you're at a, an lpj event you're watching the girls on tv you're going to see some things <clears throat> that are closer because of the speed elements yeah yeah i think one one huge thing for any club golfer that's trying to learn something from tour players is being able to watch the way that they practice we all know that golf's a wildly inconsistent game mm -hmm. ha ha having said that i I think that there's certain things from a consistency perspective that are worth worth chasing. When you watch the girls practice, the best girls, you know, you'll see stations and drills and things that they're working on from a technique perspective, also from a maybe a, a shot back to technique perspective. So they're trying to they're trying to hit specific shots and learn how to be best at the technique that provides those shots. You know, I, I think I hear you talk about that, and I think of one of your premier clients for many, many years, and that's Christy Kerr, because the first time I watched her play, she was wearing round glasses at an AJGA event. My younger brother was playing, and, and I was caught by her because she had this crop of curly hair, and, and she looked like a real gritty sort, but there was always this, like, I'm so focused, and I, exact, I know exactly what I have to do sort of mentality about her. I felt like that's enviable and it's something that uh, everyone can adopt and try for more improvement. Yeah, I think Christy's a definitely very driven golfer and very creature of her habits. Uh, one of her, one of her huge strengths in her game throughout her whole career is her putting. Okay. And I've often heard people talk about this with Tiger. They can't figure out why they haven't copied it exactly. And I think Christy's a good example of that too. She, She's kind of done the same drills <clears throat> her whole life as it pertains to putting. Not really. Um, 
I mean, she might, she might tweak them a little bit here and there, but there's some staples that have been in there since she was 15 years old and she still does them pretty much every day when she's practicing, unless, she, unless it's just going to be to jump on the course and play a few holes. If she's going through a practice session, she always starts the same way. She kind of has her same ideas that she focuses on similar to like free throws in basketball. It's kind of like I, I equate it to like a stroke check. She knows if, if everything's good in her drills, then she's ready to play. Well, pray tell, because you mentioned Tiger and drills, and there's one that stands out to me. He starts every round and practice session with it. There's two tees on the green, width of the putt ahead, and then he hits some right-handed putts through that gate, um, just trying not to hit the tees and hit the ball uh, squarely. What is something that Christy would do? Because I'm sure the fans would like to know. Christ, Christy does, uh, she uses a chalk line Okay. Uh, every every day. She creates a gate for the ball. Mm-hmm. Um. The ball gate's pretty tight, two tees on either side of the line. Right. And then she uses she uses tees in a similar fashion, but not right on the toe and heel of the club. She's got one for like a backswing path and one for a through swing path. So if you picture a tee maybe 10 inches back on the on the chalk line, just outside the chalk line, because her stroke does tend to go out a little bit in the takeaway. And then in the through swing, her her follow through will sometimes pull a little across the line to the inside. So she'll have one that addresses the heel going through. You know what? I love that. And, and I want to camp here a little further. Um, all these professionals are super disciplined. And, and you've highlighted this with Christy Kerr. They're super disciplined in knowing what their tendencies are. And then when they practice, they create environments that are going to neutralize those tendencies some. But what I want to ask you, and I want you to help the listener slash viewer, is that you know, it might seem mundane and they don't just do this once or twice or three times or whatever, and then forget right. it. This is a daily occurrence and they stick to the stuff because they know that habit is somewhat reliable, you know? Right. I mean, she's, I think if you told Christy, she couldn't do the, her warm up drills, she'd probably tell you she's not going to be ready to putt. And I think that that's, that's one of the, one of the cool things about spending a lot of time with her as it pertains to her putting is, I think every time she goes to the first tee, she feels like she's ready to putt because she's done the prep, the prep work. Does that mean she's going to putt well? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It doesn't it just makes, it puts her in the right frame of mind. Like I'm ready to go. I've done my stuff. I've got an opportunity to play well and putt well, whether that happens or not, you know, is irrelevant. And whether if she does putt great, she still kind of returns and does this, does similar things. If she wants to cool, do some cool down putting work, she'll kind of revisit the same drills and then she feels like she's got her work done. Another interesting thing about her putting, I'm a pretty firm believer in that throughout the years we worked together, she's she's last to the putting green and first to leave. Really, huh? Hey, you so know, the, to me, that's just a testament to the way that she does things. She knows that she's accomplished more in a shorter period of time than most people do when they're there for hours. Uh, do forgive me here. There's someone at the door and the dogs are going yeah. bananas. I'll be with you in yeah. one sec. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I just want to pause this. So do forgive the outburst by my dogs in the background there, but what I, I just want to revisit what you were saying about Christy and the discipline of just doing the same thing all the time and not feeling that she's so she would be completely ready before she's done the drills. I feel like there's a lot for people to learn there. And, and, and I'm inclined to go to the fact that, the putter and these drills have such a big influence on not just the score, but what happens throughout the bag because of the confidence thereof. Would you agree? Yeah. Oftentimes we'll try to mirror what she does in other areas of her bag off the putting just mm -hmm. because of what it, what it does for her from a mental perspective. So I think it's good if you, if you know that there's a couple of things that you can do and they may become more in depth when you're working with a coach off tournament site. Right. But if you know that there's things that you can do that give you good feelings and make you feel like you're prepared to play, I think that's, that's a wonderful thing to be able to, to, to work on, you know, and a lot of times throughout Christie's career, she'll, she'll play a great round and she'll be like, all right, we got to go to the range to work. <laughs> she'll, go to the, she'll go to the range and she'll hit four balls and she'll be like, all right, I'm done. I got, you know, like, so it's just a, it's a, like an affirmation of sorts. Uh -huh. that you're that you still have you're still doing the right things and you feel good and you're ready to go for the next day and the folks who've listened to this podcast just so you know they like they, they're about to go oh here he goes again with a low-hanging fruit thing I, I want you to reiterate to all of yours and listeners the value of being able to save strokes around the greens i, I know we live in a power era but you cannot 
out dodge or out maneuver a, a bad putter. It's just not it's it's not viable day in and day out, right? No, I mean put, putting. Let's say short game in general, right? Short game in general is going to make up for a lot of mistakes. So you mm-hmm. can. I mean the old the old saying. Can your short game ever be too good? The answer is, is really no. It's not. Mm-hmm. Cannot. And it's a great equalizer too. It's something that keeps it keeps good rounds from going bad, and it keeps great rounds great. So you know, if you can make a couple saves here and there, you can you can have a really really low hot round, and sometimes a, <clears throat> a few good short game saves will save a round too. <laughs> You're, the, you're you're a real professional at this. One of the the insights you wanted to share on what the golfers can learn from the LPGA players and the players you've worked with, I've sort of digressed a bit with the Christy Kerr um, information, but you said to me, you wanted to speak about how to manage yourself and to play bad better. Now, when I hear play bad better, I just love that because the truth about golf is you're likely to have way more bad days than good days. And the measure of a good player is what does he or she do on those bad days? I think you don't really the light is not shown upon it as brightly as it should be. Mm-hmm. The, the interviewing question is, well, how did you do today? And the answer is well, I got it around. I shot two. Un- I didn't have my A game. I shot one under or two under. Mm-hmm. I think that that's a huge, huge mark of a great player is being able to get, you know, get it in the house without yeah. losing too many shots and being able to shoot a decent score. And it's, you know, again, it might seem obvious to a lot of people, but, if you shoot a really low score one day and then you, you shoot a high score the next day, it doesn't really matter. So it's, you know, it's a, a good low score backed up by a good, a good bad score or even par or a little bit under keeps you, you, know, in keeps, keeps you in events, makes, makes cuts, gives you a chance to be around on Sunday. Well, let's mind that a little bit, shall we? I mean, it's one thing to say, I want to learn to play bad better. So if someone was coming to see you and, and they're a decent player, what sort of insights, what advice would you have to them? for them uh, in terms of like, I'm out there and I don't have my best stuff. Is it decision-making? Is it like um, leaving alone certain flags, just a different focus, trying to go to one shot shape? What would you say to them? Probably it's a combination of elements. It's some decision-making. It's choosing good opportunities for scoring versus maybe, you know, opportunities that are, are more difficult that you might attack when you feel like you've got all of your faculties and, okay. You know, can you get a ball in play off the tee that doesn't feel like your, you know, your full, your full on tee shot swing? Can you can you hit a shot shape that's consistent? And if you if you can't, what can you do? Yeah, because it's like the I think, and I see it a lot with juniors today. Is like, oh, well, my swing doesn't feel great. It's like, well, guess what? It's never going to feel great all the time. <laughs> you, you might think that it's going to, but it doesn't work like that. So, I think that's a, that's a big thing in teaching today. Is you know, we've got so many great teachers out there that are helping golfers of all ability levels. And they really need, I mean, kids, kids need to know what to do when they don't, when they're not functioning well, they need to know emotionally what to do. They need to know intelligently what, how to play, how to minimize big numbers and be able to, you know, at the end of the day, get the lowest score on the card that they can. Well, this sort of sounds like you edging your way towards another point you wanted to make. And that was speaking about game like training. Because uh, folks listening to this, all in sundry, really, they, if, they, if indeed they go to the range, they are got a perfectly flat lie. They hit the same club all the time. And look, that's all fine and dandy if you're trying to groove something. But to be able to get by your bad day, the training has to be different, right? I think we're, we're probably all guilty of that, too, in the coaching environment. Is, you know, people go, people go to the practice facility and they hit balls. You know, they're conditioned to hit balls, loosen up. Um, as it pertains to short game, they might do things from too much of a block practice perspective where they're just hitting the same shot over and over and over again. Yeah. And normally I see it a lot with, with better players too. I think if you give a better player the opportunity to hit five balls, they're going to be pretty good by the fifth ball. But if you give them one chance, you know, it becomes more evident where their, where their, their strengths and weaknesses lie. You know what? I, 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 I've got to stay there because this happened to me the other day and look, honesty, I have not played very much golf over the last how many years. And so I've had a few weeks off here before we get back on the road. So I went and hit a few shots and I felt like it was getting better. And then all of a sudden someone came up to me and they said, okay, hit this one shot now. 
And mm. I got over there and I could feel that it was all of a sudden different. And I had this one chance to deliver. And of course I failed desperately, but it was what you say there. It's, it's like just hitting until you're good where, okay, I've got to make it happen on this one occasion now. Right. And then, you know, here's a, here's a, I think a reasonable one as it pertains to short game is, you know, a lot, a lot of, and again, I'm, I'm not talking about just tour players here. I'm talking about club players and junior golfers. I think we teach them. Sometimes we teach them too many shots too soon, you know, so they're not good at any of them. So it's like, and I, and I see that a lot in, in like pitching and shots from a hundred yards and well, let's say like shots from 50, 60 yards. And they're trying to hit too many trajectories. They're trying to hit too many different patterns where it's like, if they get, if they're able to get good at hitting a couple different shots and they know what windows they're in, mm -hmm. they immediately seem to get better at distance control and understanding the speed that they need to fly a ball a certain distance at a certain height. That's such, a good, I think, that's such a good insight because if I think of, you know, golfers that have really impressed me. Look, they have a certain shot if they need to hit it. But largely, they're going to go to what they're able to do. And I'm sure you see a bunch of that with the high-quality golfers that you work with. Yeah, I think that they, they have some patterns that they know work, and they're inclined to use to go towards those patterns where, you know, I think as we're, as we're teaching younger people, people that aren't, don't have stuff as ingrained or don't have the belief pattern in the, in the stuff that they have they tend to fluctuate too much they'll try to hit shots that they can't hit yeah and they shouldn't hit well well i think the shouldn't is such a very important such an important part of it because that gets back to the making the smart decision on the golf course to get by the bad day and and i want you to embellish here even on the good day there are shots that the professionals will sort of look at and go mm -mm, not right now i'm gonna not fold but i'm gonna play smartly around this and keep the momentum alive. Yeah, I think that that's a great point is, is, you know, like green light, red light, yellow light pins. How does it fit to a player's pattern? If there's a, you know, a right pin, draw a pattern, things are going good. You know, a little slip up might, might cause things to go a different direction, knowing what shot to hit there, if hitting it 15 feet left of the pin, trying to make a putt, you know, playing the right shot at the right time, I think it's, it's critically important. And, it, and, most golfers, I, at least with my experience on the LPJ tour, I think that they, their patterns are pretty built in, you know, like, I think you see more variety on the PGA tour for sure. With ball flight, you see more shot shaping in the LPJ tour. You, you tend to see players that have pattern that they stick to mm -hmm. most hey, of the time. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, along those lines. And I listen to what you say and somewhere in my head, I've got this word discipline that just keeps on popping up and everything you're sharing. I would say it's almost like the overarching theme when you talk about shot patterns and decision making and having a go-to off the tee. All the professionals do it that you see that you work with. But it takes a modicum of like discipline and stick to my strategy to do this consistently because golf, we can get wrapped up in the emotion of it so fast. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that it's a, it's a great topic to go further into. I think a lot of, inexperienced players are more inclined to hit shots that they think they can hit that the odds that they can hit them are very low. <laughs> yeah. So if you, uh -huh. you know, what should you hit here? I should hit three wood. How many times are you going to pull that out off out of 10? One, I'm still hitting three wood. It's like, you shouldn't do that. Right. You, so it's, it's like the discipline to make the right decision is, is a very critical skill. And I think that at an early age, that helps that helps players shoot lower scores better and they're, they're better for it. I heard it said to me the other day, um, <clears throat> the instructor called it having like a second serve in golf and everyone playing this, if you don't have, let's say you're into tennis, some, and you're playing a game with your buddy, you have the first serve, you take a big whack. And then the second serve, you have to get it in. And sometimes that thing's just dinked over the net. So it starts the rally and you in the point. Uh, what you're saying is some of that, right? Absolutely. Like uh, I, I call it having a B, a B drive, you know, like what, what do you, what do you hit when you're not feeling like you can hit your best one? <laughs> to that end, to that end, I mean, everything you're saying just fits into the topics you were wanting to touch. And, and the one thing you mentioned was just to know one's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, every great business does the SWOT analysis, you know, the strengths, weaknesses and such. 
but countless golfers listening and watching watching this thing they're like uh, they don't really know what the strengths and or weaknesses are they're probably very aware of the weaknesses but they never really respect them and they try and hit the shot anyway and that's an important point too i think that too many people that they, they want to be able to hit every shot and the answer is you really don't need to be able to hit every shot and i think that's a dangerous thing even for a better player mm -hmm. so you know, like if you're not very good from 40 to 60 yards, you can practice it like crazy to get better at it, or you just stay away from it. And don't hit shots from 40 to 60 yards. And there's a famous Tiger story about that a couple of years back. Um, I think they said the the forgive me if this is incorrect, but they said the yardage was between I think it was between 40 and 50 yards. And the question was how many times did he have it for the season? And the answer is like six. You know, so it's like if if you know where you're not good, yeah. Don't spend much time there. <clears throat> hey, hey, along those lines, uh, help the golfer, because um, I watch a lot of LPGA golf on television. I have a daughter that plays the game. Um, nice. The, a, a lot of the, the really good golfer, when they're setting up to over a tee shot or maybe an approach shot or whatever the case might be, but it's a shot where there's disaster lurking, like Woods with a 40 to 60 yard shot, you were saying that oftentimes it's not necessarily that they're going for the target. They're sort of playing away from the problem a little bit and setting up the next shot and sort of keeping the round going on. Is this the truth in, in your experiences? I think you have to have a plan for certain situations. Every golfer has shots that they face on given golf courses that they don't like. So, and I think every golfer has probably experienced that. If I, if you, if you interviewed, any golfer coming in for a lesson and say, okay, let's, let's talk about this golf course. What tee shot do you like? They're going to say, Oh, I love this one. Yeah. And then I hate that one. I can't hit that one at all. So it's like, how do you, how do you come up with a game plan for situations you don't like? Cause you're probably not going to be able to change the fact that you don't like what you see out there. So being able to adhere to some like recipe card of a shot you're going to hit in that situation that you've practiced and you know that you can hit mm -hmm. normally helps. Yeah. Versus, versus trying something that can cause disaster. Yeah. Well, along those lines, I'm sure in all of your years of golf teaching, you've seen this, you know, you'll have the golfer that comes to you and they're all listening. They're like, well, I hate my eight hour or I hate my sand wedge. And then mm -hmm. they think they've got to practice for this thing to get better. What would your advice be? Would it be like, Hey, let's try and navigate around this thing a little bit, or do you work on it some and then sort of see how it's going when, when pressure and competition rolls around? Sometimes that's a sign of an equipment issue, you know, like where the, where a golfer will say, I love my seven iron, I hate my six iron, or I hate my eight iron. The first thing I would do is check the equipment to make sure that it's appropriate. It falls in line with the rest of what they're playing with. You know, that that's something that's still a, I see from time to time. Or you'll hear a player say, I have to swing this club differently, right? Because yeah. the way that the club is built or the the components that are in their bag doesn't play well with the rest of their set so they feel they have to make some kind of different swing to make that club work <clears throat> well, along those lines because you know i've um, this is probably something you've seen a bunch too where the golfer will come and they'll be like well i've got a driver swing and i've got an eight and, and i've got an iron swing is it the same sort of thing that maybe the driver doesn't fit or it's just that they may be trying to do one thing and or, or two completely different things with the golf club in hand mm. I think components co components of both swings are different. Yeah. So I, I think that's a common a common th thing that I've heard is, well, I, I'm very good with my irons and I'm not good with driver, or I'm very good with my driver and I'm not good with my, good with my irons. And a lot of times, there are elements of each swing that are present in the other that don't belong there. Uh, I e somebody who might be a little steeper with irons that keeps it with their driver, yeah. right? Or somebody who's very let's say good and shallow with driver swings, but keeps that with irons and it doesn't play as well. Well, along those lines, I think this is a cool thing to learn from LPGA players as well as how, you know, they might pick up a mile an hour or two or whatever in terms of speed, just raw speed, but just getting more out of the driver, how they maximize conditions to do that. So would you talk about that some, please? I think the, the faster speed players, you don't, you don't have to hit up as much. Mm -hmm. but when you get into the 90 to 95 mile an hour players hit it far you, you probably have to have a positive more positive angle of attack i mean christie's 
sometimes I've seen her as much as six degrees up. So yeah, sure. she'll, she'll, she hits up and takes the loft off, which is a little bit of a difficult concept for a lot of people, but that gives her beautiful launch conditions and low spin. And she's able to carry the ball further because of that. The more level her swing gets, distance decreases a little bit. So on the LPJ tour, I think you're going to see more girls, the, the, let's say the average speed girls, probably going to be average to lower speed girls are going to be a little more upward in angle of attack. And then as you get into the higher speed girls, maybe not quite as much. I'm sure there's going to be, there's going to be some, <clears throat> just like there are on the PJ tour. There are guys that have really high speeds to hit up and they hit it far. I would expect but, I would expect, and this is a lesson, in my opinion, for a lot of the club golfers <clears throat> listening, is that the LPGA girls then are sticklers for things like ball position with a driver and such, because if the thing's too far back, then they have to start tilting to elevate, and that just throws the cat amongst the pigeons. So I'm sure a lot of the alignment, body positions, ball position prior to pulling the trigger is a big deal. Uh, am I correct in my assumption here? Yes, and I also think that in the, in the way that you transition from irons to, let's just say, to, to directly to driver, some things, ball position being one, maybe chest, chest alignment, shoulder alignment, changing to offset, angle of attack being more positive than negative, you know, so certain setup things have to change as well. And that would lead me back to like the consistency question, right? Is like, okay, yeah. golf's a terribly inconsistent game, but when you're looking at the best players in the world, most of the time, you know, they're pretty consistent with the way they do things as it pertains to the shot that they're trying to hit, you know? So, so that is true. If they're trying to hit a draw, they're going to set up one way. If they're trying to hit a fade, they're going to set up a different way. Now those setups are different, right? They're not consistent, but they're consistent as it pertains to the shot that they're trying to hit. Mm. And they're trying, they're trying to be very good at knowing what those components are so that they can repeat it in a tournament setting. I would want to take that consistency question further because that's a question that a lot of folks have that are listening to this. Like, I want to get more consistent. And typically my response is, well, you've got to be consistent in your approach to your swing and your reaction to the shot because you're not going to be that consistent swing-wise. And if I watch the LPGA player, they're not losing their minds too many of them after bad shots and such. They're, there's consistency in pre-shot, post-shot, everything they do. Yes? And I think that I think with mental coaching going as high up as it has gone in the past 20 years, I think they're coached that way too. So mm -hmm. the, the, they're coached if they're going to get mad to get over it quick, you know, and be able to, to post shot routine stuff is really important, right? Replace a bad feel with a good feel and move on. Yeah. Hey, I, I want to ask this question uh, and, and I'm not trying to be like, you know, have some sort of bias or whatever, but, I have had the luxury, and I call it luxury because I live in Columbus, Georgia, and we've got a huge military base, Fort Benning, close by. And so we right. have a lot of Korean folk over here, and they come for lessons, and they work hard. Uh, I, I want you to, and, and I, I'm guess getting back to the discipline and your observation of consistency, but the level of input that these people have and the, the, the discipline that they have in their work, uh, to me, was mind-numbing. I want you to talk about that some because is that the separator on the LPGA tour right now, or is it some something else? It's a great question. Um, I think before the advent of or the influx of a large portion of Korean golfers, say Repak was on the LPGA tour, and that's what basically started the spark. Mm -hmm. um, she she ironically she and Christy went through tour school the same year, nineteen ninety. Uh -huh. Seven, yeah. They actually went to tour school the same. This, they went to tour school the same year, and they finished one too. She was an, a remarkable player, and I think that that was kind of the catalyst that started things going in Korea to make golf a bigger, big, bigger and bigger game. I've only been over there one time. Mm -hmm. I must say, I was pretty impressed at the golf landscape, what it looked like. I was I was in Incheon for the women's LPGA tour event in 2016, and it was, it was pretty interesting to see how the interest level, I mean, from, from the driver or from the golf course in Incheon where the girls were playing in the distance, you could see a range that was two stories and 360 degrees around. And it was packed the whole time. It was packed. I'm certain. Packed the whole time. Yeah. And now we've got, as you just said, you've got a lot of players that are showing up and in, in different areas of the country. This past winter, we probably had five or six, they call them academies teams 
I'm not sure. It doesn't relate to academy as we would use it, right? These are these are groups of people that train with coaches in Korea, right? Mm -hmm. And they come over during the winter months and they'll spend time in La Quinta, Palm Springs area, for maybe uh, six weeks, six to eight weeks, and all they're doing is is just grinding on golf. So this, like this past winter, I worked with, I got to. I'm not saying I'm their coach by any means. I just got to spend time with some really talented young. Korean golfers. One one boy, twelve years old, I think, is the best in the country, mm -hmm. and his sister, fourteen, was like in the top five. And they were both unbelievably gifted at a very young age. Like if you wa you watch some of these juniors hit golf balls at age twelve, and you think because you've watched people hit golf balls for a long time that they're like twenty, and they're twelve, and they're twelve, you know. Mm -hmm. And you see them show up at the golf course at seven, and then you see them leave it you know, five thirty, six o'clock when it's dark. And, and that's not, I don't think any of it was forced upon them. Like I genuinely think they were kind of enjoying their time, enjoying the weather, enjoying the courses, you know, practicing really, really hard. And that's, you know, that's, that's probably why we see a lot more of those players on, you know, specifically the LPJ tour, but I think you're starting to see them more worldwide too. I need you to advise dads now. And I, I throw myself into that bunch because the young Korean ladies and men that I've taught, um, dad is standing close by, arms folded, not saying a word, just paying close attention and almost sentinel, you know, almost the fortress there. And, and uh, afterwards, you might get a question or two or whatever, but uh, there's a level of respect from the young people that to me is, is heartening. But advise us dads listening, because I, I feel like there's a pressure that they bring over there that a lot of us are trying to navigate between like, well, I got to be dad, loving dad, accepting, caring, all the rest of it. And then coach guy who keeps the thing on the track. So, so what would your input be? It's a hard, it's a hard one. You know, I think that parent involvement in golf is something that's not going to go away. I, I think you see more and more of it on the girl's side than you do on the guy's side. I think you see that because fathers are probably trying to protect their daughters, you know, whereas on, on the boy's side, it might not be, you know, the, the feeling isn't as much the same, right? They're, they're not, they're, they're letting their boys go and play golf and become men. And on the girl's side, it's like fathers are still trying to protect their 17 year old daughters that are trying to play golf for a living. Yeah. <clears throat> the best ones I've seen, the best parents I've dealt with, they, they give you leeway in what you do. They, they give you space, mm -hmm. communicate. They might question you at times, but the best ones that I've dealt with have been been fine with it. They kind of they allow the coach to coach and the the parents parent. Uh, this is a question to you, the instructor, to the LPGA player. Sometimes mm -hmm. the shoulder to crown. I'm guessing after something didn't go accordingly, and then also for parents listening too, because you know golf, whether it's at the club level or at the competitive level, there's going to be that situation where it's the bad day, and we're trying our best to respect Brian Lebedevich and get the best out of our bad day, but it doesn't work out. We miss a late putt and it costs us something. The, the apre golf, the after golf advice. Um, you, you work with golfers at the highest level. Talk to that a little bit and how you, how you help the golfers to sort of get by those bad days. You gotta have a good short term or a short, short term <laughs> memory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A short memory and long drives. Is that the key? <laughs> you got, you got, well, you gotta be able to forget fast. I think, I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it at the, at the highest level. I've seen, I've seen a, a final grouping, you know, shoot, shoot a high, high scores. I've seen people fall on their faces. It's yeah. just, you know, that the, there's an old, an old saying, fall down seven, stand up eight. So it's like, you know, you're going to keep doing it. I keep trying to stress it with the, the juniors I teach that you're always going to have a balance of good and bad. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what level you play at, you will have good and bad. And when you look at the best players in the game, Tiger probably being one of the exceptions because he had, he probably had the longest run of really positive stuff, right? Every great player, it seems like has ups and downs. So they'll, they'll be hot for a while and then they're, they're kind of hanging around, but they might not be as hot. And then all of a sudden they'll pick off a couple wins and get hot again and then they cool off. Yeah. And I think that that's more visible this is my biased opinion being more of an L on the LPJ tour. I think the girls have to play more consistently than the guys do because they need to make, they need to make a better living over a longer season with less money. Mm -hmm. The guys got to play good 
they've got to play good maybe two or three weeks, four weeks a year, right? To have a pretty one win you're in the playoffs, basically. You've kept your yeah, confidence. So, so the girl the girls is a very it's a very different game. Now, some cool things that are happening. I mean, the 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 US Open this year. Biggest purse ever, right? Yeah, I mean, 1.8 million to Minji Lee. That's a huge, huge increase. When Christy won in 2007, she made 560. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, KPMG this year, they doubled their purse. They went from four and a half million to nine million. So those are huge steps in women's golf. And those those tournaments are probably going to drive you know players harder and harder because purse being as large as, as it is, you can make up a very big portion of your earnings in a couple of events. Yeah, but I still think to your point, and you've done such a beautiful job of weaving your way between these observations that are helpful. And you talked about consistency. Um, you watch the ladies game and they make the smart decision all the time. You, you never really see sort of rash stuff going on. Whereas on the PGA Tour at times, you know, you get this, you know, I'm playing super aggressive. Then all of a sudden stuff is tapering around the show. And I, I get the feel that that is something the listener can take away from this and that smart decision making good practice knowing who you are these are the sorts of things that you can learn from watching the lpga player yeah and <clears throat> i mean they're 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 great golfers oh the yeah girls the girls are fantastic golfers but speed being more normalized i think that the everyday viewer is going to learn a lot more from watching the girls for sure um i, I want to ask this um Touching, I, I want to circle back to the strengths and weaknesses because this just popped into my head a minute ago. Yeah. Um, when you're on the course, you kind of go with what you have. You try and avoid your weaknesses as far as possible. We've talked about that. Yeah. But when it comes to development, and you, an instructor that works with golfers of all skill station, and you identify your game, you're like, here's my strengths, here's my weaknesses. But now I want to galvanize. I want to strengthen up my weaknesses a little. What is the practice ratio you would recommend? Because I've seen so many golfers and I've been involved with working with them where we got to work on something that becomes the major focus. And all of a sudden, what was the strength is not necessarily the strength anymore because it's been neglected. So what's your take there? I think you have to identify exactly what the, what the issues are. So if you're working with a club golfer and they've got ball flight issues, excuse me, your contact issues, those things need to be addressed through specific drills and hopefully they have a positive effect as it pertains to different elements of the game. It might make a weakness stronger and it might make a strength stronger. Yeah. So. <clears throat> um, but in terms of practice sort of ratio, let, let's say for argument's sakes that, that, that I can strike the ball pretty well, but the putter is really leaking and costing me right now. When I go to the practice facility and I have an hour to work, um, what would you say? Hey, go spend three quarters of that in the green or, or, or what is your recommendation to the listener here? I would do specific things. I would, I would, what I would try to do is map out a game plan that you're going to stick to for a week or two okay. weeks, a month, a month where you're going to do the same exact things when you go to the putting green every single time so that you become comfortable with those elements. The more comfortable you become with those elements, you're probably going to see some area of that part of your game improved now again you have to identify what it is is it short putts is it medium putts is it lag putting i don't i don't know that's for the coach to determine but when you set up a specific way of working on that area you should be able to look at it after a couple of weeks and say okay i see some improvement or i don't if mm -hmm. i'm not seeing as much improvement as i'd like to see what do we need to change to to get more out of it i hate it when when people just go to the green and don't do anything or they go to the range and don't do anything, you know, it's like, you're, yes, yes, you're there. You're present. I'm here. I'm going to hit pots. I'm going to hit balls. But it's like, how do you, how do you learn if you don't have any means for feedback? How do you get better if you don't know what's, what's going on? And that's what I feel like, again, as, as we go back to short game for a second, I think the average golfer, that's what they do. They, they show up at the course, they've got 20 minutes, they hit balls for 15, they go to the putting green, they take three balls, they drop them 15 feet, they miss three putts and they're ready to go. And that's like the worst possible scenario that you could draw up for, for somebody. So if I, again, if I, if I had 20 minutes or 30 minutes and that was it, and it wasn't a tournament, I'd, I'd probably be pretty detailed in how I yeah. warmed up and got ready to play. Well, you know what I love? I love a man or a woman who practices what they preach. And you began this conversation with Kerr anecdotes who you taught for, what, 15, 16 years or whatever it was. 
and you talked about how she does the same thing all the time and you basically circled all the way back to that spot and you finished it off to say look if you got 15 minutes do something worthwhile there on the green don't just go and fill time and, and i appreciate you for showing the consistency that you've spoken about yes yeah, it's, it's um I don't know. I think the longer I coach, the more I go back to, to similar ideas like that. And when you watch somebody that's been so successful do those things, there has to be something to it. Yeah, there's a, there's, there's a heavenly sort of a simplicity about what the greats do, and they do it consistently well. I think therein maybe is the special source, don't you think? It's not like they're doing something crazy, mind-numbing. It's just that they're doing the fundamentals consistently and correctly. And I think that's maybe a good point to... to tie things up too. And I didn't say this earlier when we were talking about patterns, but it's like, you know, as golfers begin to play golf, they develop habits mm -hmm. or patterns, right? So typical slicer, right? It's going to have an, an, out, an outside path and an open face. You, you address those things to try to make them better, but they still are going to have patterns. And, and they, I think amateur golfers, less, lesser golfers are guilty of trying too many things. Yeah then they don't ever develop any patterns. So what do you have at the end of the day? Confusion. And nothing, you've got nothing. You, you can't do anything that you know you, that you think you can do, right? You, yeah. You've tried 8,000 different patterns and now you don't really have anything. So it's like, I see that as being something that is important to junior golfers as they go through growth spurts. <clears throat> College golfers as they're navigating academics and tournament life, tour players, as they're trying to be to be better on tours, like how do you how do you get to the tour and then change everything, right? <laughs> it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. It's you, you get to the tour and all of a sudden the first thing you do is you change equipment because somebody's going to pay you a little bit more, but the equipment doesn't really play well with your with what you do. And it's like, okay, well, you know, what's the trade off? Are you gonna are you gonna play your best with this equipment because somebody? you know, is paying you to play it or do you, should you just play what you did before and you're going to play just fine. And I think the girls tour is actually interesting as it pertains to that too. Like they don't have really extra lucrative club contracts. So they tend to play things that they know work well for their games. And I think that's important. Like I think for, for younger players or people that are coming up and they're getting into the competitive golf ranks, it's like, okay, you have to find, some things that you know work. And when you find things that work, you know, keep keep them, right? Or or understand what those things are. Don't don't just be so open to change all the time. Like I, that's something I try to teach the younger players that I work with is like, look, if all you have is, and I just said this a few minutes ago, but it's all if all you have is change, that's all you have. You don't own anything. So it's like what what things do kids start to learn at a young age? And I think that's where Christy picked up the putting stuff. Is like, what things, what skills do they learn at a very young age that get built in that are good and you should leave alone? Yeah. Versus always being open to changing. Yeah. Dangerous golf. Golf can be a dangerous, Jeez. dangerous game. Yeah. No kidding. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's the Reverend Brian Lebedovich. I mean, you are preaching there, my friend. Okay, I've kept you for a long time. I'm so thankful to you. Uh, for the listeners who want to find you more, what's the social media? What's the website? Where can they go, please? On Instagram, it's at Brian Lebedovich. It's my handle there. And the website would be through pjos.com. And if they come out there to that beautiful spot in the world in Palm Springs, they can probably hunt you down if you're around? Oh, yes, they can at PJOS. Oh, fantastic. Listen, thank you so much for your, t for your time. And more importantly, just for sharing some tremendous insights that I know will help everybody's games improve. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it.